Through the different brewing methods, cuppings, shops, and interviews I've experienced over the past few months, I've come to believe that coffee is subjective. Everyone can have a unique way to experience it that's perfect for them. Because with so many options, there's no black and white answer and we have to find a gray area. I'm on Grayson and this is The Coffee Shop Project. So when did you start roasting coffee and why did you decide that you wanted to roast your own for the proverbial cup versus source it externally? Oh, I mean that I can't really take any credit for either. My uh, my folks, they, they had back in Portland, a uh, little chain of drive throughs they called real time coffee roasting, roasting for you. You know, they had a neon sign that they would click on when they were roasting and they had a little plexiglass window just to the right of the drive through itself where you could see the. they had a couple of fresco roasters. And uh, That's so cool. It, it's really neat. Uh, so yeah, they, they brought those with them from Portland. So always had access to those. And even before I started selling wholesale was doing that for myself, uh, mm -hmm. just for the catering. So I was able to really grow that. And, you know, now we got a 15 kilo uh, drum roaster, which is great and, you know, scaled very well. Yeah, I was always able to do it for myself at minimum. And that's just been a real blessing from the Oregon days. You know, it was just put it on one and hit start and walk away and it'll be done in 10 minutes but <laughs> so I got to kind of play with the curves and you know tweak a little bit even on the air roasters so I've definitely been able to improve it to some extent just on the profiles that come out of it but yeah most of it's just been from the get-go that's awesome when I I'm a tiny bit of roasting has all been with my little popcorn popper and you have to babysit that a lot and kind of watch it to make anything decent right. with your real roasters do you kind of like program it like a computer and it does it for you or do you kind of watch it and make sure that everything's perfect with your own eye oh this one's very manual so i okay. mean you uh yeah it's it's not like the big one nowadays but yeah you just set every parameter you got a program hit start and you can walk away and it'll be done this is not that this is this is a very manual uh you know the gas the airflow the flu uh, drum to every everything on it is on you as it goes so of course i've got it hooked up to you know program on the computer where i can track it and i can mm -hmm. see all the previous roasts and everything um, but you, you are making every move yourself still do you enjoy that aspect of it that you kind of get to sit with it through the whole process it's definitely fun uh, mm -hmm. it can be you know every once in a while you mess one up and it's disappointing mm -hmm. but the uh yeah being that hands-on is probably the it's definitely more enjoyable as the roaster because you do get to be that hands-on yeah. uh shifting to the production roasting once you do have a curve figured out yeah you know, it's a gift and a curse you know you, <laughs> you it is more hands-on and interactive backside has to be more interactive do you think it means even more to you when you get to go to events and do a catering event that you know everything about your brand from the roasting to the drinks to everything and make it more interesting to talk about to the people you encounter Oh, it definitely is. It's fun to be able to engage people like that. The amount of people who really appreciate the coffee, I mean, you, you, especially at general catering events, like let's just say a wedding. That's, you know, not, that's maybe a third of my business, but it's, it's a good joke. You know, there, it's just, it's general public. It's not people who really sought out coffee. You're just at an event that they're at and you have coffee. So there's maybe... 10% of people that know what an actual good cup of coffee is. So the amount of people you really can engage is pretty limited. But having said that, it makes it that much more special when you can. And you can really, you know, talk someone through. And if they didn't like it, you can try to pull a little differently or something like that. I mean, you, you can really uh, have that. So yeah, it, it's a lot of fun to be able to walk people through the story, if nothing else. For you, what is the most fun kind of event to cater? I mean, I've gotten to do all sorts of things, especially here around Nashville. Um, there's been stuff downtown, you know, Bridgestone, where you're back in the green rooms and there's all these country artists. I don't even know who they are. And it's, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, that's neat. But the, uh, I'd say the most fun are actually just the, the really intimate weddings I've ended up being at, you know, often where it's like less than a hundred people. And you were like, when you're 1% of the budget, you just feel like a, a cog in the machine. But when you're really like, it, you're the big thing they splurged on, they just really want you to be there. And it just it made the wedding for them. And you just get, I don't know, it's just delightful to be, everyone's so appreciative. It's, uh, I say those are the ones I've enjoyed the most. It's all about engagement, you know, really getting to connect with yeah. people. Since a lot of events have definitely been put on hold this year, Due to COVID, I've seen a lot of weddings and stuff canceled. What has been the biggest challenge that you've encountered and how have you kind of adapted with that? Well, it's definitely been, like I said, I had a, you know, six cart set up. So I, I was the only guy in Tennessee who could really do like thousand person events. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really cool. But 
no one really cares anymore. There's not those large scale events. Uh, who knows? Yeah. Maybe they'll come back. Maybe they won't. Uh, whoever knows what this new normal is. But so it's just <laughs> it's trying to pivot to where, uh, you know, it's, it's like people are doing in society just to smaller events and, you know, social distancing being sure you don't have, you know, a line of people just waiting there standing around each other. Mm -hmm. uh, just some different throughput. So like some different clients I've had from throughout the years uh, where they used to have, let's see, you know, oh, doctor's days and nurse appreciation things um, mm -hmm. instead of having just me at the cart and people come through and line up and chat, you know, it's the hangout thing. So it was, yeah. it was, they wanted to push that instead, maybe they'll, you know, take orders ahead of time and get everyone down and they'll have a runner uh, be able to deliver drinks, something like that. So yeah, just pivoting to smaller events where you can encourage mask and social distancing and all the things you need to do nowadays. Well, before COVID, what was the biggest event that you ever catered? Oh, there is, uh, let's see, one that we do a lot is just stuff for Vandy, uh, Vanderbilt downtown, any of their big student events. You know, we'd have seven baristas between the six machines just to have everyone covered. Uh, just mm -hmm. have in between because something would always go wrong. That was always fun, just trying to knock out as many people as you can because they'd have, you know, 1,500 people come through the auditorium mm -hmm. and you're just trying to capture as many as you can. Uh, building appreciation things for some big buildings downtown where they have like all the tenants of, you know, 12 different levels coming down to the, the break room downstairs and you're trying to, the same thing, just serve as many as you can, as quick as you can. Yeah, a couple different big conferences that are always fun. Uh, of course, didn't have them this year, but, you know, guys we've had for over the last eight years do it annually yeah hard to say i'd have to look back see what the single biggest is but that sounds so much fun just like the fast-paced atmosphere it's like a fun kind of stressful is the only way that i can imagine it on your end does it feel that way oh absolutely like i mean me i've got you know let's say i've got five or six people coming out to help but uh -huh. i've got to line everything up ahead of time and i'm just trying to think through every event i've done okay what will fail like there's, there's going to be something it's not what it's just what will so trying to pack everything up just being able to and then i don't know thinking on the fly when something happens you didn't anticipate um mm -hmm. and just you know mitigating the best you can you know one time i had yeah the, like the uh the limit switch on one of the lingas last time that that trip so i mean i yeah, trying to swap the machines i have them bolted down the carts and that so i gotta okay is it worth trying to unbolt it swap the machine out and then fix this in the next 10 minutes is this really going to help or would it be better just to you know be one machine down and help out where I can? Just little things like that. Definitely high paced stressful. But then for the event itself, let's say you only got four hours. You know, you really need to serve. It's so fast. You just got to turn it on <laughs> and knock it out. Um, Does it kind of like feel like a fever dream? Like you go into it and you're like, okay, I'm on autopilot. And then it's kind of over. Absolutely. Yeah, I can't. I figured out I really don't eat well, like at events and stuff. You know, I, I, I can do it before, I can do it after. But when I'm in that zone, like I, I can't, like I'm just. <laughs> One track mind. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Because you don't know what people are going to be interested in, like when you go into Vandy and you have like college kids and college kids, they drink coffee on such a range from like super sweet drinks to full on black coffee. How do you prepare and even can you prepare for like what amount of ingredients you will need to serve your audience? Sure. I mean, uh, most everything that I do is espresso based. So that makes it pretty easy in that, you know, you, you bring, you bring all your syrups and you can make sweet drinks if you want. Uh, but you can usually, you can gauge the clientele relatively well uh, okay. in that, you know, it, when there's, I mean, honestly, like the, the student events, those are often more coffee forward, uh, okay. you know, so you don't have as much on the sweeter end, but you still, you always have the option to make both. So it doesn't take too, too much. Um, you know, when it's a younger crowd, definitely more milk alternatives, um, little things like that. Yeah, for brewed coffee, uh, that, that's definitely on when there's, like definitely at the weddings and stuff, I'll, I'll often bring air pot. Um, just when there's, people just want black coffee. You yeah. Know, you, can, you can do Americanos as much as you want, but they'd really just like a black coffee. What age demographic, from all the people that you've catered to, which age demographic do you think is most interested in the craft coffee experience versus I just want a cup of black coffee? Oh, I mean, you find people all over the spectrum. I wouldn't say there's an age in particular, but you know, the, the ones who definitely have the most interest 
and want to engage, I'd say, you know, mid twenties to thirties, I, I guess, if you're trying to pick an age range. And then I find there, there's point diminishing returns where they might care, but they don't really want to talk about as much. So, okay. <laughs> but I wouldn't try and put too much of an age on because I've had people all okay. over that are just really into it. You know, shoot, there was a uh, 14 year old who was just telling me all about everything he'd read from Perger and uh, yeah, <laughs> just going off on it about a year ago. And that was, that was a lot of fun. That's really interesting and cool to see younger people and kids more in my age demographic getting into it. And for me, I've been reading a lot about it and I was reading about like the different waves and that we're on like the third wave of coffee, but we're kind of on the brink of fourth wave coffee. What do you think fourth wave is going to encompass and look like for the consumer and those really interested in it? Oh, I mean, all these things have been so abstract, depending on who you ask. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been really impressed in the last decade just with I mean, what Scott Rao's done with a decent machine uh, and just a, as far as being able to analyze every aspect of what's coming out of a shot of espresso has mm -hmm. been astounding. Um, and, you know, it seems like sky's the limit on that. Just if, if we keep going at this curve of what we're able to pull out of the bean, it's, it's going to be just a very exciting next five years. As far as the consumer end goes, um, like what Mark does, I, I, I um, don't know how much you guys talked about his super automatic experience, but what, you know, Eversys and other yeah. companies have been able to do um, just on that end, it's, it's really amazing how much of the process you, you, you can rely on the machine instead of the barista. So the barista mm -hmm. can focus on the customer experience end and the machine can do just about everything at this point. Um, so there's still the you know, the stretch of theater, the, the art mm -hmm. of it, that's, uh, yeah. that's certainly not been lost yet. But mm -hmm. as far as the, you know, mid-tier shops where you don't, let's say you got an ice cream shop that wants coffee too, all of a sudden they can have good coffee, great coffee, yeah. without having to have someone on staff that's really well trained and having to pay for that. Because the coffee. machines are getting as advanced as they are, how are handcraft coffee shops gonna keep up do you think and make sure that they're always offering something that the machine can't aside from customer experience um i don't think you can really take customer experience out of it that'll always be something people are willing to pay for it's always going to be the you, you can't tell a machine a, a machine can't tell you what you would like right so when yeah. you have a uh, someone there that can really walk you through um you know which direction to go why that's 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 a different thing that's a different problem yeah. than the um than the machine just being able to do what you ask it. You know, any computer will do exactly what you ask it to, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's just code. But you have to be able to talk to it to tweak it. Yeah, I don't think it, we're going to lose any of that anytime soon. And the other thing you mentioned, and that was espresso theater. For that, is that like latte art? Or is there even more of a craft to it than I think? Oh, I mean, it's, it's the whole A to Z process. So, I mean, just having the machine there in general. Let's just say you get a nice linear or a slayer or something there. I mean... It looks great for one thing, yeah. just sitting there before you even touch it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then being able to, uh, like the one thing the Eversys machine can't do, you know, you're still just tapping button and it's doing everything. So being right. able to, you see the grinder, you see the grounds coming out, see someone tamping, you know, they're puck prepping everything, they're tamping mm -hmm. it well. There's, just, there's something to that. That's just such a coffee shop experience. You know, even in someone steaming and let's say they just get too many bulbs and you hear that, you know, the tapping of the milk pitcher on the counter, like everything has its little, it, it plays its piece, you know? <laughs> That's so interesting. I never thought of it as like a complete sensory experience and like the way that you put it. That's really cool to think about. Well, yeah, I think if you take it away, you might notice it. That's what, uh, like if you go into a shop that doesn't have it, I think you, you might appreciate the things you, you don't really recognize. I'll definitely keep my eye out for that in the future as I go to more shops. The last question I had to wrap everything up is you've seen a lot of the coffee industry through your own experience, through your parents' experience and your familial history. What would your advice to someone wanting to tap into the coffee industry now be? You know, be willing to do what you love and really pursue it and don't expect. I mean, like I said, even me starting out in this, none of it was a guarantee and none of it. I always try to have a fail safe setup. So, you know, definitely Pursue it, do the best you can. And uh, if it's going to work out, you'll, you'll find a clientele to be willing to pay for and you can keep doing it. It's uh, And if you can make it work, it's one of the most rewarding things, I mean, in my experience that I've ever done. But it is, it's it's hard. You know, there's a, you see a lot more shops fail than make it. It's, uh, it's, it is an uphill battle for sure. But, you know, it's easier than Hollywood, so. That is true. <laughs> well, is there 
anything I glaringly missed to ask you? And do you have any products or websites you want me to plug? Uh, my coffee is available at Proverbial Cup. Uh, I'm trying to set up the subscription-based thing uh, this next month. If you're in Tennessee, you know, always open for catering events. I uh, don't think you missed anything. It was you know, a great set of questions. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Most definitely. You too. Bye. Bye.